and I didn't really know how to deal with military bases. I didn't know what they looked like. The only thing I knew was Gomer Pyle, which I <laughs> had watched when I was a child in the 60s. Military bases, of course, aren't like that, and the two with which I dealt, um, which, with, with which I have been dealing, are Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas, and um, Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina. So one the Army, one the Marines. <coughs> They're, of course, like cities. You know, they have high schools and fire stations and, and Walmarts and everything else. And there are 100,000 people. It's not a small unit, which is what I had initially been expecting. And when I went there uh, the first time, which was Camp Lejeune, and this is Colonel Hopper, the, the chief of um, the division to which I was speaking at Camp Lejeune, they had never seen anyone like me before, and I had never really seen anyone like them before. So there was a, a period where we needed to get acquainted, and they asked me to give the lecture for the officers before I gave it to the troops, because they wanted to see, and this is understandable, that I wasn't a latter-day Jane Fonda who was going to say something that would be inappropriate for the troops. They didn't know me from Adam. You know, here's this guy wearing tweed who comes in, <laughs> says he's an archaeologist. What exactly am I going to say? But once I gave them the lecture, they were unfailingly helpful. And in fact, Colonel Hopper was worried that the room in which I gave the lecture to the officers wouldn't be nice enough. Um, for the lecture I was to give the next day. And so overnight, he had it carpeted and painted <laughs> with new pictures hung on the wall, as you see here. And when I entered that room, I knew it was the right room the next day, and I said, this is a completely different room. It's painted, it's carpeted, there are pictures on the wall. And he said, yes, I was worried it wouldn't be nice enough for you. <laughs> and I said, but only 24 hours has passed since we had this conversation. And he said, we're the Marines. <laughs> we can make this happen. And I thought, maybe we need some at the university. You know, <laughs> buildings and grounds would take six months to do this kind of thing. And the questions that I got from the soldiers were just incredible. I mean, they were not only interested in what I was saying, and one knows immediately if anyone falls asleep in an audience. Nobody did, and they clearly were keeping track of everything I was saying based on the questions I received at the end. Questions that weren't just random general questions, but someone I remember said, but who was the father of Asher Nasser Paul II? And I thought, <laughs> oh my god, you know? The, it was hard enough for all of us in the AIA to become experts in Iraq and Afghanistan right after this happened. Most of us are not experts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Jane Waldbaum and I were fielding calls from National Public Radio and everybody else. And I know, speaking for myself, there were times when I was ready for those radio interviews seconds before they began <coughs> because we just hadn't been teaching archaeology of Iraq and Afghanistan. And ultimately, I came up with the correct answer, which is to Colti Ninur to the second. But that's not <laughs> a household word even for us. So uh, they were an incredibly um, interested and alert uh, audience. And one of the nice things that they often do is to sandwich me between more somber sessions. In, um, in pre-deployment training, as some of you know, and I hope there are some men and women from the military here tonight, you only have an hour to get across whatever message you need to get across. So at the end of that hour, you, you can't go over. Once the hour is up, they are on to the next unit, the next uh, session, the next um, issue, because there are so many that have to be given to them in the course of pre-deployment training. And so um, not with this one, but with the first one at Fort Bliss, they put me on after suicide prevention in the field, <coughs> which was, of course, a very somber uh, talk. And then I came on. And, um, and said, here is Iraq and Afghanistan in ancient history. And of course, the change in tenor between those two subjects automatically gives you a more alert audience. Um, and they've done that a number of times, for which I'm very grateful. And what I was surprised by um, at the beginning is how moving I found it. At the, I'd never given the military much thought before, I'm ashamed to say. Um, I had viewed the military almost as a monolithic entity. I hadn't seen it as a collection of men and women who follow the orders that are given to them um, in the course of the service that they're performing for their countries. And as I began to talk to the men and women who were stationed here at these two bases, you know, they, they would say, we, we feel like America doesn't really appreciate what we're doing. We're risking our lives. We see our friends die. 
And this is hard for us. So they were incredibly grateful to the AIA for taking time to come to the bases and to speak to them. And as they took me on tours of the bases and I would see monuments like this with the dog tags of all of their friends who had died, it was incredibly moving. And I kept saying to myself, you know, as they gave me gift after gift at the end of my lecture, a picture book of Baghdad and a, a T-shirt that said the few, the proud, and the brave, and uh, a Marine's coffee mug. And I mean, the gifts just kept coming. And uh, you know, I was on the verge of tears. And I thought, you can't cry in front of the Marines. <laughs> this will destroy all of your credibility um, that you're, you've been trying to build up in the course of this program. But in any event, um, I would like to expand this program. So far, we only do Camp Lejeune and Fort Bliss. But um, what I would like to do is to give you a sense of what it is that I'm telling them. I won't give you the whole lecture because we don't have time for that. But I start off by giving them a sense of what archaeologists do and why it's essential that we find uh, antiquities in context, so the archaeological context of art and an antiquities, how it's essential that we have controlled excavations and how everything that we find is vital for historical reconstruction. So animal bones and human bones tell us something about nutrition, seeds, carbonized seeds that we find during flotation tell us something about the environment. We put all the pieces together and gradually build up a reconstruction of what happened in a particular period and place. This is something to which they haven't been exposed before. But I, I want them to see that these are all pieces of a puzzle. And if we don't have them in context, then a part of history is destroyed. I obviously use um, images from Troy um, to uh, elaborate some of these points. So these are lion bones. These aren't actually lion bones, but I needed bones. And this is a slide that had bones in it, so I just gave it to you. But um, we did find lion bones in the sanctuary at Troy, which are from skins um, that decorated the wall of a sanctuary to Sibylle, whose sacred animal was the lion. So I tell them something about that. Um, and the slide on the upper left is um, excavation of Bamiyan, which is an area that some of them are familiar with because um, they've seen action in Afghanistan. And I try to indicate the importance of preservation, how if they find something in the course of their work, they shouldn't try to take it out of the ground. They should alert the archaeological authorities. So we go over, to some extent, um, preservation of wood, of painted surfaces, of pottery, of metal. And I try to give them a sense of the problems in conservation that we have and that they will see, because so many of them are stationed in southern Iraq, where things are constructed of mud brick. And so the problems of conservation from mud brick are particularly difficult. I also emphasize looting and how looting is the enemy of everything that we do. So I show them the, I show them the site of Zabalam in a uh, Sumerian uh, site in southern Iraq where all of these holes that you see are from looters. So the entire site has been looted over and over and over and over again. And I usually show them something from eBay, where one can find a whole host of antiquities for sale at any given time. Um, this one is a Babylonian lion, about 600 BC, um, which I pulled from eBay. But one could pull any number of objects. If you just do a search on eBay for cylinder seal, um, you'll be surprised how many hits you get. I also emphasize that these looters, the thieves of antiquities, do not look like or act like Cary Grant in To Catch a Thief. That's not what this is about. These are people who rob from archaeological sites and they also are engaged in the drug trade, so the heroin trade, and um, arms sales as well. This is all part of one activity of international crime cartels, drugs, prostitution, antiquities, uh, gambling. <coughs> it all goes together. And it's difficult for them to see that. It's difficult for the public sometimes to see this. Because what we see is a work of art on a velvet pillow in a window on Madison Avenue. And so you don't see the trail of blood that leads to that velvet pillow. Fred Hebert, my colleague at Penn, was telling me a story of um, a village in <laughs> Afghanistan where uh, the um, residents of the village had been looting an archaeological site and selling to a middleman. When they found out that the middleman had been escalating the price 100 times over, and so paying them only a fraction of what the antiquities were actually worth, they murdered the middleman. And then the um, crime cartel for which the middleman worked set fire to the village. 